Hey, everybody. So, uh, Starry Night is an iconic painting from the 19th century. Golden Gate, an iconic bridge from the 20th century. And this is an iconic achievement from the 21st century, a work of art created by an artificial intelligence. So again, I'm Dr. Eric Risser, and I'm here to give you just a brief history of creative AI. So, but first, you know, like, what is creative AI? Well, technologically speaking, it's kind, of the, it's kind of where computer graphics, machine learning, and computer vision meet together in the middle. Um, but if you think about it another way, let's look at it in terms of zombies. These three heads were created by a human as examples, and then they were fed into a computer which looked at it and learned, and then it created the rest. So another example would be this little small patch of rocks and leaves and dirt that was scanned from the real world, it was fed into a computer and then it extrapolated it out to create an entire forest. Uncertain how all this works? Well, that's actually good. You're halfway to the answer. It runs on uncertainty. Or if you think about it another way, imagine you're a newborn baby seeing your first ever human face. There's a lot of new information here. There's two eyes, a nose, a mouth, the shape of the head. Now let's say you see your second ever face, and it's a zombie. So there's new information here. There's blood, there's scars. Um, you've never seen any of these concepts before, but th now there's repeated information. There's still you know, two eyes, a nose, a mouth, shape of the head. Now you see your third ever you know, head, and again, it's a zombie. So you know, there's, there's new blood splatters, there's different scars, the lips are a little chewed up, but at the end of the day, you're becoming less uncertain about what a zombie is. So at the Predict conference, you'll probably see a few graphs, um, but I doubt you'll see the zombie graph. So here we're, we're plotting unique information over total information, and we start to see a curve form. I call this the uncertainty curve. Um, and it's true of any data that follows a category, be it zombies, cars, dogs, hipsters, anything that's like a well-defined thing that follows rules. So the goal of a creative AI algorithm is to essentially create new data that follows this curve and extrapolates it out. If you don't follow this curve just right, you know, if you go too low, you'll end up just copying and pasting your inputs. And if you go too high, you'll break that category and you'll make stuff that doesn't make sense, you know, a zombie with you know, three eyes. So creative AI is cool and it's making a lot of new stuff possible. So we've shown you how you can take a photograph and turn it into a painting, but you can also take paintings and turn them back into photographs. You can take small examples of something and imagine you know, more of it. And you can even swap the, the textures from one object onto another. You can create people who have never existed. And you can even take rough sketches and turn them into, uh, into imaginings of the real world. And in fact, our friends at NVIDIA have even shown us how you can hook that sort of concept up to a, up to a simple painting interface and show what the painting tools of the future will look like. So you can take old video games and make them look new again. And you can even create whole new 3D objects from just a single image. So the future is pretty cool. Um, but I think it's important to actually take a step back and before moving forward, kind of look at where all this came from. So it all started with an ancient field called texture synthesis. and this academic field of study is actually older than I am. Um, and the idea is, given a small amount of something, you want to make more similar but different that thing. Uh, again, really old field, um, dating back into the 80s. But the first paper, I think, that, that really kind of hit a mark and, and hit some notoriety was Efros and Leung in 99. Um, this wasn't necessarily the most sophisticated or best texture synthesis paper, uh, but it was really simple. They, they figured out a way to, uh, to you know, kind of tie it to the concepts of Markov random fields and just made a very approachable short paper. Anyone with a computer science degree could read it and go in and play with it and apply it to their fields. So this actually sparked a whole lot of interest in the space, so much so that it, it kind of kicked off uh, a series of papers that came out year after year. So next up was Wayne Lavoie's uh, Street Tree Structured Vector Quantization. Uh, this was the first fast, good uh, texture synthesis method, in my opinion. Uh, quite seminal. Then Aaron Hertzman, the next year, published Image Analogies, which uh, added the concept of coherence to the process and did a lot of great applications. So it was actually the first style transfer approach. Um, now, it required image analogy pairs. So you needed, say, like a photograph of a bowl of fruit 
then a painting of the same bowl of fruit to give correspondence. Then if you had another like, photograph, you could style transfer that. Uh, Wei and Lavoie then returned in 2003 with, uh, with the notion of, this, uh, of a way to take this inherently sequential algorithm and make it parallel so it could be ported onto the GPU. And that was really kind of the, the startings of modern texture synthesis, uh, which was really locked down by, by Quattra in, in 05, where he added the concept of an expectation maximization algorithm to it. So now it's fast, it's stable, it's principled in statistics. Uh, and as of today, like most texture synthesis algorithms are actually based on this Quattro paper. So Kopf et al., uh, this is a cool one. He added the concept of, of histograms and triplanar projection to allow you to build volumetric textures. So this was kind of our first real meaningful foray into 3D shape synthesis. And then Han et al. took this concept of instead of having big images and going to slightly bigger images, let's go with very small images, 128 by 128 pixels, and then grow out like 32 by 32,000 pixel images. So massive multi-scale dependencies. And then Barnes et al., I don't actually have an image for this one because it's more back-end work, but I think it's one of the most important papers in our space. So Connolly figured out how to, uh, how to take these inherently really slow algorithms that would take hours or even days to run and get them running in like a second or two. And that's actually what powers content-aware fill in Photoshop. So it was the first uh, algorithm that actually made these things practical for real-world application. Uh, then a uh, little bit uh, schizo, but my, myself, Risser et al. Uh, my contribution in 010 was taking these, these algorithms that go from small images to large images, synthesizing out on the infinite image plane, and you know, kind of shifting the way we think about it to hybrids. So, now you have a few members of a population, and then you grow out infinite populations. So, you know, structured, you know, higher level, uh, higher order things. Uh, Mike then in 13 hooked it up to a paintbrush for the first time and showed how we can actually draw sketches and then relate those to textures and start painting with texture instead of sketches. So again, art tools of the future. And then, Gatiss et al. happened in 2015. So, at this point, you know, the space was kind of slowing down a little bit. A lot of the low-hanging fruit had been picked. Um, but in parallel, neural networks were kind of going through the whole ML and, and vision world. And things that have, had existed previously were kind of being turned upside down thanks to neural networks. And Gatiss uh, was basically that paper for our field, uh, the first one that used a neural network to uh, apply it to the same topic. And, uh, I remember when, when Barnes wrote me, like the day after this paper came out, he's like, hey, somebody did really bad slow texture synthesis, but they did it with a neural network, which is extremely cool. And it was, uh, it was the first parametric method that actually worked. All previous ones were non-parametric in nature. Um, but what really made this cool wasn't necessarily their texture synthesis, but when they applied it to style transfer, and it worked super, super well. So this let you essentially turn a picture of your cat into an oil painting, and it kind of took the internet by storm. And I really think that this is a super important paper for the field, really seminal, uh, not just because of what it brought, um, but because what it did for the field. It really brought creative AI into the limelight. Um, it stopped being kind of an esoteric, uh, you know, SIGGRAPH graphics geek thing. And, you know, I'd start to see people's profile pictures on Facebook run through these algorithms. It, it started to hit the mainstream, and I think Prisma got App of the Year in 2016. Um, and it brought a lot of fresh blood, fresh ideas, fresh learnings into this space. But it wasn't perfect. Um, this would have been a texture synthesis example you'd expect from Gatiss, but half the time, this is actually what you get. So uh, Pierre Wilmot and I uh, kind of went in and, and wrote a follow-up paper, which, you know, kind of stabilized some of the optimization. So Gatiss would be on the left, our, pro our results would be on the right there. Another example, uh, Gatiss's results, our results. Uh, in any case, texture synthesis was just the beginning of creative AI. There, there are other approaches have emerged. Uh, while Gatiss was working on uh, neural style transfer, uh, Goodfellow was working on the concept of adversarial training. So this is similar to the, the hybrids approach where you throw a whole bunch of data into a neural network, um, you know, and then, and then start imagining new members of that population. So you kind of bake the concept of a category into a neural network, and it's generative. Uh, Isola then did a follow-up where he, uh, 
he controlled it with image-to-image -image pairings. So you can then actually control this generative process, of, so image-to-image -image translation networks, and that could you know, turn a black and white photo into color, it could turn day to night, night to day, uh, it could turn sketches into real-life drawings. And again, <laughs> they made it with cats on the internet, and it kind of took the internet by storm. <laughs> So, Zhu et al., uh, this is a pretty cool paper, uh, CycleGAN. So, basically, building those image-to-image -image, uh, pairings was a huge training set problem, so he, uh, he kind of detangled the need for an exact you know, image-to-image -image translation match on the training set side, so you could kind of just learn the, the inherent qualities you're, you, you care about. And then Keras et al. took these GANs, which are, which are inherently quite unstable and difficult to, to, to train and difficult to, and slow and difficult to, to make high resolution, and figured out how to do that through stabilization and image pyramids. So again, all of these people never existed. Um, so this was a, yeah, so this work uh, really kind of took, in my opinion, adversarial uh, networks from you know, the lab into something that you know, could be used in, in real life for real applications. And speaking of real applications, I think it's important to, to point out Ledig et al., which uh, applied this to a real-world use case, which is up-res. Um, so original image on the right, down-resed on the left, uh, right there, uh, SR GAN, that took the down-resed and tried to reproduce the original. So, you know, going back to the last talk, putting these, these, these networks on the edge, now all of a sudden we can take basically bad video on the internet and turn it into good video. And all of your old photos from, from old digital cameras in the 90s and early 2000s, you can, you can remaster them basically for free. So that's what the past looks like for creative AI. And I think it's important that we recognize you know, where all this stuff came from. Uh, what does the future look like? Well, I think it's time for it to, to go into industry. And you know, that's what my company does. So uh, there's a problem. Uh, Art, art has gotten, 3D art and, and digital media has gotten more sophisticated over the last 20 years. And as the quality's gone up, so has the cost. Uh, this is what a graph of the number of artists required to make a Grand Theft Auto game looks like, as well as the uh, budget. <laughs> so, yep, Creative AI can totally help with that. Uh, this was a recent photogrammetry demo done by Unity Labs uh, that they released last year at, at GDC. And they actually used a lot of that texture synthesis technology to automatically go through and, and, uh, and fix uh, problems with a lot of the scanned data automatically so humans didn't have to you know, do it in Photoshop. Um, a local artist at, at Havoc, Pete McNally, went out and scanned a bit of a rock wall here in Ireland, modeled a really quick cylinder, and used Creative AI to essentially fill it in with detail. Um, another artist in, at a AAA video game studio scanned these two pebbles and, and a beach sand and built this entire parametric, controllable, uh, generative uh, beach generator, really. Um, so this is how video games and 3D worlds kind of will be built in the future, where you start with examples and you kind of curate it, and then you have like some really high-level controls to kind of just let it do whatever you want, really. In any case... Uh, that's the end of this talk, but just the beginning for Creative AI. Thank you. That was fascinating, Eric, and it's amazing to see how um, these textures can be modeled into real-world scenarios. So it's like the virtual world is becoming bigger and more real every day. So um, is this how Minecraft worlds get generated? <laughs> you know, the way they you know, spawn a new world, it just looks brilliant straight away? I wish. <laughs> no, actually, Minecraft just uh, it uses a procedural algorithm. Okay. So that would have been a human who, who wrote code and wrote the rule mm -hmm. system of how those blocks would be, would yeah. be put out. Um, right. Whereas this would be a learned system where, yeah. uh, where you could show it examples of Minecraft yeah. worlds and then it could make more similar ones, which would, is absolutely a future that the Minecraft world is, could have. There's no limit to what you could do with that, really, is there? Yeah. So what's next in the industry for creative AI, maybe outside of gaming or computer games? Sure. Um, so a lot of these algorithms are, are inherently image-based, and a lot of the big problems in the industry uh, aren't just limited to, to images. You know, you have, you have shapes, you have animations, you have audio, you have how it all fits together. And I think that's really the future, is, is seeing this expand to, to kind of other, other, you know, problem spaces. Very nice. Thank you, Eric. Cool, thank you. Very cool talk. Thank you. Yes. Super. I'll take the clicker. Ah.